Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. So before we went into the break, we mentioned there was a question po uh, posted on the community discussion page, and it actually didn't go up until just now. So we'll restate the question. What are you doing to include diversity in your arts organization or community? So now you can go share your thoughts, and uh, we'll hear some of those answers a little later. So on to our next speaker. Tackling diversity and inclusion for any organization can be challenging. It can be hard to get past that first question, where do we start? Our next speaker has some guidance. She's the Executive Director of Theater Communications Group, which has launched a multi-year diversity and inclusion institute, which 20 plus theaters along with Theater Communications Group formed the first national cohort to develop action plans for diversity and inclusion. Please welcome a SphinxCon founding partner, Teresa Eyring. Um, it's really great to be back here at Sphinx, um, Sphinx uh, Con. I came last year for the inaugural conference and I had the opportunity to speak. And I've been thinking a lot lately just about connection and connectivity and how we bring all of these really fantastic conversations together and work together to make change. And I was also thinking about my talk last year and how I was, I just seen a, a research report about how social media and other um, kinds of tools had reduced the degrees of separation among people who don't know each other from six degrees of separation to three degrees of separation. And I was also thinking about how um, the arts actually can reduce the degrees of separation among people who might not otherwise know each other. And in my talk, I, I mentioned that there was actually a building, and I'm gonna remind those of you who uh, were here last year and tell those of you who weren't here last year that I made the connection between this building which was designed by my grandfather, a very prolific architect in Baltimore, and this young man um, who happens to be Tupac Shakur, who when this building was converted into a, an arts high school, he was a student there. And it's actually where he wrote his first rap and um, I feel connected to him because that building was designed by my mother's, my mother's father. So um, one of the things that happened between last year and this year is I met a guy who uh, is an activist and a radio host in Baltimore, and he started talking about the High School for the Arts, and I said, oh yeah, I know that building, my grandfather designed it. And he said, oh, I know that building. It was in front of that building that I was arrested for the first time. So I said, what were you arrested for? And he said it was an act of civil disobedience because in the early 60s, um, that building did not allow blacks to swim in the swimming pool inside the building. Um, so this, th there was a club that occupied the building at the time, and it was the Knights of Columbus, which is a Catholic men's uh, club. And even if you were Catholic and male, if you were black, you weren't allowed to take advantage of some of the opportunities in this club. So he was protesting that. He was arrested. Um, and he's gone on to be uh, a, a, a great activist since then. But I've been thinking over the last year just about how buildings and neighborhoods and, um, and social structures evolved to be exclusive, and in some cases, unconsciously. In some cases, they are consciously exclusive, and in some cases, they're unconsciously exclusive. Um, even though we have laws on the books, we have civil rights acts that have been in place for many, many decades. And so what we have been thinking about and what we've been um, really working on at TCG is how we make sure that the theater field is not inadvertently creating exclusive structures. And we believe that we have a lot of work to do in this area. Um, part of what we do at TCG is we work to create a better world for theater. We try to make sure that the environment and is healthy and the tools are are available for theaters to be as strong as they possibly can be. But we also believe that the world needs to be a better place because of theater. And in order to do that, theaters need to be modeling new pathways, not replicating weaknesses that exist in our society today. Uh, so one of the areas that we've become extremely focused on is the area of diversity and inclusion and equity in the arts and particularly in theater. Um, we determined through a strategic planning process 
with our board of directors uh, two years ago that diversity was a core value for our organization. And in fact, we are a very diverse organization, but that we wanted to see uh, that core value really enacted through leadership for the theater field to help our field have the tools and have the, 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 the sense of purpose around building more inclusive uh, structures and organizations. So we, be, we developed a diversity and inclusion initiative which has six points to it, and I'm gonna talk you through those and ultimately talk with you about one particular initiative that we're very excited about, our Diversity and Inclusion Institute. So um, we decided that whenever we bring theater leaders together, and when we bring theater leaders of color together, for instance, um, who have been around for years and years, as well as young leaders of color, we often hear people say, we've been discussing diversity and inclusion for so long, and there hasn't been enough change. Um, now, I want to say that we do define at TCG, we define diversity very, very broadly, but what you're going to see as I go through our diversity and inclusion initiative, you're going to see a lot of references to race, racial and ethnic diversity, because for the moment, we're slightly more focused on that particular area of diversity. So, we just decided that we wanted to begin by establishing a baseline of information. That includes doing a demographic survey, which we're calling represent, because what we'd like to do is make sure that theater people around the country can identify themselves rather than having, say, the HR person in the organization say, well, I think we have five people who are African American and three people who are Native American and so on. Instead, we want people to self-identify and that is why we're calling it represent. Second is a literature review. I think we all know that there has been quite a bit written and spoken of research that's been done over the decades about the state of diversity in the arts. We want to pull together a resource with our colleagues, we don't want to reproduce any effort here, um, that where people can go and really look at what's been written and what's been researched through the years. So we kind of, you know, again, have more of a baseline of what's already been talked about and whether we've made any progress. Third area is we are going to be doing a legacy video project which is uh, really trying to capture the stories of some of the, the people who are the founders of many of our theaters of color, people who are real trailblazers in our field in the earlier part of our theater movement. Um, so we're gonna be working on that so that everyone today and in the future can benefit from their stories and their experience. The second aspect of our diversity and inclusion initiative is really the action-oriented programming. And we have three initiatives within the action-oriented programming as well. One is our Spark Leadership Program. This is an outgrowth of a program that we've had for the last eight years called Young Leaders of Color. Um, through this program, we try to bring as many as we can young leaders of color to our national conference every year and provide different kinds of uh, training and tools and connectivity and networking. We now have 80 alums of that program. Um, and I am happy to say that two of them came to this meeting uh, Jesus Reyes and Patricia Garza are here from Center Theater Group. Um, nurturing theaters of color, this is also trying to, to provide different ty types of tools and knowledge for our theaters of color. And the last one, which is by no means the least important of these, is our Diversity and Inclusion Institute. What we wanted to do with the Diversity and Inclusion Institute is address a problem that we saw uh, out in the theater field. We have about 500 theater organization members and another one to 200 university affiliates as well as thousands of individual members. But focusing on the organizations, we saw that there is inequity in our field in terms of staffs, boards, artists, and audiences. We saw that there is a lack of knowledge in terms of how to build and execute action plans to advance diversity and inclusion. And we saw that there were perceived barriers to getting started on any kind of diversity and inclusion program. And some of those perceived barriers are um, people say, we can't really get started because we don't have the money, we don't have the funding. Or we can't really get started until we have a plan. Or we can't really, we're, we're afraid to talk about it. We are not sure we have the right language to talk about diversity and inclusion efforts. And then also, particularly when, uh, when talking to boards, that are not particularly diverse, just a sense of we don't know where to find the people who would want to be on our board. So our solution was to develop a diversity and inclusion institute. It kicked off 
last year in, in June as a pre-conference to our national conference. It was in Fort Worth, Texas. We had 20 theaters participating plus TCG, so there were 21 in the, in the cohort. And what we did is we looked at all different aspects. We took a very deep dive into all different aspects of diversity and inclusion. Best practices for div diverse and inclusive recruitment. Valuing diversity versus managing diversity. You heard Clay talk about that earlier. Um, looking at different terminology for anti-bias communication. Developing diversity and inclusion policies and committee structures. And measuring and evaluating diversity and inclusion work. Um, I just want to read to you a couple of things that our consultant, who is absolutely extraordinary, Carmen Morgan, um, communicated to the, the participants in this uh, very, very deep, um, intensive gathering. One thing she said is, a message to the leadership staff and board members, the most important quality that is found in leaders of organizations that are highly inclusive is that these leaders take a long-term holistic approach to diversity and inclusion and integrate it into all of the work of the organization. Uh, with respect to some of the points that you see here, valuing diversity versus managing diversity, it's important to care that diversity exists. It's important to care that organizations are inclusive and there is a sense of, of equity. Setting up organizational structures and systems that allow for that environment of equity and inclusion are what is, what is true management and leadership of that value. Another area, for instance, just to give you an example, in terms of best practices for inclusive recruitment, she talked about active recruitment being required. If you're not getting out of the office, if you're not doing enough, if you're not getting out of the office, you're not doing enough. It's important to attend conferences, meet people, meet with department heads at major universities, cult cultivate diverse networks, um, and, and really expand your network so that whenever you're recruiting, you have you, you're, you're reaching out to people you don't know already, um, and you're really working to uh, have a, as diverse as possible of a pool of candidates when, when you're recruiting for a position. The other thing that really, um, these, these last two, understanding personal identity and social location and ally building, what we've learned as we've gone through the work is that where people are coming from personally is very different. Um, depending upon who you are, where you grew up, what your parents' attitudes were, what you, how you identify from a race perspective or from uh, a, a gender identity perspective. And that we really have to help people understand their personal circumstance and their personal point of view in order for them to really have um, as much impact on the conversation about diversity and inclusion with organizations as they can. And ally building, which is simply um, Recognizing that there are people who might identify, for instance, as white, middle class or upper class male in his 60s, who is an ally for this work, and we need allies. Um, it also is true that sometimes we've been finding in, in my own organization, for instance, that people sometimes feel excluded from the conversation of, about diversity because they feel as if they're somehow not, it's not them. Um, that, and, and having everyone participate and feel that we're allies together is, is crucial. Um, I just wanted to show you, these are the 21 Institute members. Uh, you heard about California Shakespeare Theater earlier. They're one of the Institute members. Um, and they are located all over the country, although we have quite a few states that don't have any Institute members at this point, And hopefully they will join soon. Um, one of the great things that happened is last fall at our Fall Forum on Governance, which brings about 150 trustees and theater leaders from all over the country to New York to talk about leadership uh, issues and development for our theaters, we were able to present a panel with uh, some of the people who are participate, participating in the Diversity and Inclusion Institute. So here they are. They're talking about all of the different action plans and strategies that they've been putting together that are specific to their institutions. Um, I particularly want to call your attention to the woman who is on the lower right-hand corner of the screen. That's Rebecca Fletcher from the Dallas Theater Center. She's the board chair. And she specifically came into the Diversity Inclusion Institute wanting to figure out how to make her board more diverse. She felt that the Dallas Theater Center's board, being in a very diverse community, needed to reflect the community. So from the time in June when we had the first uh, symposium workshop, to November, she had already um, had
had conversations with people on the board who were persons of color to talk about engagement, levels of engagement in the board. She had put great leadership at the head of their board development and nominating committee. She had organized a retreat where she had professional facilitation from a woman who actually handles, is, is in charge of diversity efforts within a large corporation in the Dallas area. And after that meeting, people so got it why it was important for their organization to become more diverse, especially at the board level at that point in time, that they ended up with something like 20 or 30 new nominations for the board uh, representing different uh, parts of the Dallas community. So that's a real success story. She's now being called upon on a regular basis for advice about how to really build diversity awareness on boards. Um, some of the outcomes from the Diversity Inclusion Institute, we have coordinated diversity inclusion efforts across the field. We have a national database with new theater-specific tools. We have deep learning, capacity building, and peer support and accountability. We have a growing national network of theaters leading the charge for greater diversity and inclusion. And ultimately, we hope for field-wide change that reflects a more diverse theater community. Now, I have an idea, because some of you may be thinking that's only 20 theaters, how much change among hundreds and hundreds of nonprofit professional theaters across the country, how much change will that ultimately affect? I think it will, just those 20 theaters plus TCG affect some fairly significant change. But I also wonder how would the world be different if we could launch three new 20 theater cohorts each year starting in 2015 and all 600 plus TCG member theaters and university affiliates will have participated in the institute by 2025. That would mean, uh, I think, some fairly significant sy systemic change in our field. Um, and we would also have, hopefully, more of these opportunities for our institute theaters to present at different convenings um, and talk about their successes. I just wanted to point out that our own uh, Sphinx, Xavier Verna, uh, came to our, our fall forum on governance and presented about what Sphinx is doing, so really enjoy the opportunity from, for, for, uh, for, for cross-organizational sharing. Um, and that's, uh, that's our Diversity and Inclusion Institute. Thank you. So, Teresa, you mentioned um, bringing people to the table who maybe didn't feel like there was a place for them there. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps they don't feel like they're part of what we consider to be diversity, or mm -hmm. there may be some historical issues that have to be overcome in, right. in a community. How do you go about building those bridges? What are some things to keep in mind uh, to, to bridge those gaps? Well, we've, um, just speaking for, for TCG, for our organization, uh, we have staff people who are really devoted to bringing everyone together around this, this, this particular conversation. And we have made sure to really not assume and I have to say there was a comment made earlier about the importance of people at all levels of an organization being passionate about this topic or anything that you're trying to accomplish change with. Um, people who have said it's so important for us to keep communicating and not assume that everyone gets it or feels a part of this goal. Um, so I think having regular gatherings where the why of the, these efforts is communicated making sure that people feel heard and feel like they are a part of the conversation. Um, I've sometimes said, no matter who you are, you have some relationship to this issue. Um, so feel a part of it, feel like you have something to offer. Don't assume that someone sitting across from you because they are a particular way, look a particular way, talk a particular way, are who you think they are. And so that's been extremely helpful. I also have to say that we've benefited quite a bit just by consistency in the field holding each other accountable, and having really expert facilitators who are available to help us when we get stuck. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. It's part of the reason it's important to keep that conversation ongoing is because the why piece can change over yes, time? Yes, absolutely. I think also um, one of the mistakes that, that's made, and I hear this from people who, for instance, are recruited into an organization that is trying to become more diverse, um, that that there's sort of numbers goals, 
or at least in people's minds, there's a goal of we want to we really want to see this percentage of our organization be more diverse. We want more women. We want pe more people of color. We want to be more accessible for people with disabilities. Um, but then the culture of the organization itself doesn't necessarily change. Um, and I think there has to be so much soul searching and, again, communication and knowledge sharing so that the, the organization is literally more inclusive um, and not simply executing on a, a recruitment plan. Why is that facilitator piece important to go back to what you said? When you get stuck, you bring in a, a good facilitator. Well, it's not just it's not just um, bringing someone in when when we're stuck. We actually have been working with um, Carmen Morgan from Leadership in, in Leadership Development and Interethnic Relations is the name of her company, and she's been helping to facil facilitate many of our gatherings, doing assess really deep assessments within organizations. But so she helps us. She's helped everyone feel comfortable talking and not feeling like, oh no, I'm gonna say the wrong thing and then I'm gonna be sort of ousted from this conversation. She helps everyone feel comfortable. So we've been able to have a safe space for some pretty deep and intense conversations in the theater field. Um, and we still have a lot of action to take based on some of those conversations. But Carmen and others like her are also available if you do get, find yourself stuck you know we can't get past you know we're not getting close enough to this goal fast enough what do you think we should do or um, you know any kind of issue that you might come upon those those kinds of allies and friends um, can be enormously important to these efforts um, the other thing I just want to say if it's okay I know mm -hmm. you're oh, no, probably you're fine. Um, I had a very interesting conversation at one of our conferences uh, at a TCG conference, it was actually last year, where there was a discussion about how in the arts field and in the theater field, sometimes there's a thought that when you're recruiting for a leadership position, that people have to have very specific knowledge. Um, in other words, recruiting outside of, our, uh, outside of our industry is not necessarily the best way to go. Well, there are so many people, if you go outside of just theater, for instance, who are extremely talented and, and capable of taking on different positions within our organizations. But what came up was there's this other layer, which is that theater culture is very specific, too. Um, and I don't know if this is true in music and dance and opera and, and all of the other disciplines, but there's a language that we speak, and there's a sense that if you're not from, if you somehow don't have some background in this particular business, then it's gonna be difficult for you to function. And that's another thing that we've really had to work through is just how do you think about the fact that it's not, you know, our, our language, our culture within theater or within the arts should be more open than that. We can share, we can, you know, we can bring people in and, and create a culture once again that's inclusive and celebrates everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Teresa Eyring. Thank you very much. Parachuting in. This is a term that's sometimes used to describe when news organizations send people into an area to cover a story, but not people who are actually from that place or who really understand it. So how do you bring more locally grown journalists, more people of color into the newsroom? Our next speaker will explore that question. He's the editorial page editor for the Detroit Free Press. He's also host of American Black Journal and co-host of the weekly news program, My Week. Please welcome Stephen Henderson. That wasn't supposed to happen. I'm gonna put this water down and hope that I don't have a Marco Rubio moment with it um, at any point during the speech. Uh, as the uh, introduction said, my name is Stephen Henderson. I'm the editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. Uh, and I'm a dinosaur, uh, an old style print media uh, editor who's still stomping around trying to throw his weight and show that he's still relevant at a time when much more nimble uh, and innovative creatures are scurrying about underneath, sort of undermining what I'm trying to do. 
but I also sort of refer to myself as a unicorn uh, because uh, I'm an African American uh, print, uh, print newspaper editor. And unfortunately, that has become uh, a far more rare creature to come across, um, uh, almost a mythical uh, idea, you know, the thing that you look for and look for and can't really find. Um, uh, I, I, first, I wanted to start with just some, some numbers to, 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 to accentuate what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the most recent survey of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, uh, every year they take a census of, of news organizations and take a look at what they look like. Uh, and the, the one from 2013 showed that 90% of newsroom supervisors participating in the survey were white. Um, of course, I referred to the, the shrinkage that we're seeing in the industry, the, the struggles that we're having to stay relevant. That's shrunk our newsrooms. Uh, and while employment at daily newspapers dropped 2.4%, uh, minority uh, participation and employment in newsrooms dropped by 5.7%. And so what's, what we're seeing is that uh, the, the, the trouble that we're having, uh, staying relevant, making money, keeping newspapers open, is not just shrinking the industry, it is also having a disproportionate effect on minority journalists and of course, uh, we see that uh, we see that more at the local level in big city urban newsrooms than we would at the national level. Um, I, I, that's very unfortunate for me to to, to be witness to, uh, in particular because I think of myself as uh, a great success story of uh, the diversity push uh, in newsrooms that we saw in the late 1980s uh, and early 1990s when. Uh, when the largest newspaper companies in the, in the country all sort of came together and, and decided that their newsrooms needed to be no, more diverse. Uh, and there were all kinds of programs and opportunities uh, to, to try to identify um, minority journalists at a young age, uh, get them involved uh, in the business, get them the opportunities that they needed and the experience that they needed to be Stephen Henderson, uh, editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press someday. And of course, the contraction into the industry has worked against that um, and, and really made those efforts uh, uh, almost for naught. Uh, so as a result, what we see is coverage that doesn't really reflect the communities that we're in. And you think about a city like Detroit and the profound issues that we see in the, uh, in, in the news coverage of Detroit, uh, uh, particularly with uh, our financial problems and the bankruptcy, um, this is where you get the obsession with something like what we call ruin porn, big empty buildings uh, that you see show up all over the media over and over again without the context of why that happens, what it means, whether there are people uh, who, who live near those, those buildings uh, and what impact that has on their lives. This is what we see when we see the, the, the coverage of, of violence in communities like Detroit. Uh, that so often is very surface and doesn't get to, to underlying issues, or again, that impact on the people who live here. Um, we, really, we really face uh, what I call dis, uh, we, we really face what I call connective issues uh, in, in cities like Detroit between uh, the, the newspaper and the community that we cover uh, when we don't have enough uh, uh, people from that from that place, people who have been there, people who grew up there, and who understand uh, how, how these things work, um, and why the, why the situation that we all see uh, exists. Um, it, it becomes, it becomes uh, 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 reflective of our product, and, and uh, it, it shows day in, day out in the, in the newspaper. Of course, I think the solution is, on, on one hand, very simple. We need more, we need more minority journalists in newsrooms. But it's also made diff difficult, of course, by the economics uh, and the, the, the continuing shrinkage of the, of the industry. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out in particular is the, is the lack of understanding, at least, that I see on the part of media organizations about uh, the idea of recruiting kids specifically from communities to work 
at newspapers in those communities. Uh, at the Free Press, we actually have uh, a great amount of success uh, still with what we call the high school apprenticeship program, which is uh, where we bring kids in from local high schools in Detroit and help them publish their uh, student newspapers uh, at their schools. Uh, and then they, they come and they work with us and we teach them uh, how we do things. Uh, a lot of those kids turn into interns uh, when they're in college and is the most successful way we are getting kids from Detroit into the newsroom as adults. Uh, I would say uh, that about 50% of uh, the minority journalists at the Detroit Free Press are, are people who came through uh, that program. But you don't find that program necessarily in every city. Uh, and in fact, right now, uh, the things that are contracting in the industry, of course, are uh, apprenticeships, internships, scholarship programs, the kinds of things that we do to reach out uh, to these kids. Uh, I wanted to, to, to end my presentation uh, with a video uh, that, that I've been working on for a while that I think really sort of congeals all these, these issues really nicely right now. It's, it's a story that I'm trying to, to tell here in Detroit and have been working on for about a year, in fact. Uh, it's not done yet, uh, so you're getting sort of a sneak preview uh, of, of something that, that someday will appear in the Detroit Free Press. Um, but it's a story that I, I feel like only I could tell. Uh, it's certainly a story that, um, that only somebody from here could tell about this place, uh, and it points to solutions, uh, I hope, that, uh, that only somebody from here uh, might come up with. So let's roll the video and uh, you guys can take a look. When I was born in November of 1970, my family lived on the west side of Detroit in the second story flat of a house on Tuxedo near Grand River and Livernois. It was the first place I knew as home. It was the last place I ever saw my father alive. This is what it looks like today. Until recently, it was being cared for, but when I went back last year, I found it like this. No door, no windows, open to the elements. Every memory of my father is ensconced inside. And like the structure itself, those memories now present me with a choice. Face up to your past, or walk away. It's clear that whoever walked away from the house last left in a hurry. The Christmas lights still dangling from the eaves of the brick Tudor suggest purpose and attachment. They suggest celebration, and that someone had reason to celebrate in this house not so long ago. It's only been about a year since the house was empty. When we lived here as a family, my mother found purpose in these stairs, which were then hardwood and required regular polishing. Even in the summer of 1970, while she was pregnant with me, she cleaned them with a bucket and a scrub brush every week. She had a one-word answer when I asked why. Pride. As an infant, I spent mornings in this kitchen in a high chair that sat in the center of the room where the sunlight could hit my face. My poodle, Oliver, was usually close by, licking the spoon I'd dangle in front of him. The nanny would turn the television to Captain Kangaroo as my parents went off to work. My parents divorced not long after my sister was born but she and I still spent weekends with my dad at what had become his house. In the living room, he and I watched baseball and built toy trains. And the paths through the molded carpeting on the floor became roads for my toy cars, rivers for my boats, and tracks for my steam engines. My father's record collection, and yes, they were vinyl, filled three long shelves on the dining room wall. He'd play them all day and night on a turntable that sat nearby. When the records weren't playing, the radio was. It was all jazz. Miles Davis, Grover Washington, Donald Byrd. In his world and ours, there was no other music. My dad once told us that he'd captured Santa Claus coming down the chimney, and he'd hidden him in the hallway linen closet. Santa needed a break, he said. He was under a lot of pressure. Of course, my sister and I believed. We heeded the warning not to open the door. Santa might get out and go back to the North Pole. My father lived in the house in the 7100 block of Tuxedo 
the entire time he lived in Michigan. The Parkers lived in the first floor flat and were more than landlords. They were his closest friends and my godparents. My relationship with them and him was defined by time spent in that house. From my early Christmas memories, through my parents' divorce, and through the drinking and smoking that led to my father's stroke and eventual death, the house on Tuxedo was the constant. The last time I saw him alive was there, just before New Year's Eve, 1984. It's hard to see the house now, to see the state it's in, and not think that it is somehow mirroring the trajectory of my father's life. And what should I do? If I let the house go, let it sit there and rot, would I effectively be allowing the last physical connection with my father to be destroyed? Or would letting the house go, like similar empty structures in the neighborhood and the city, be crucial to the future of the Detroit that I'm raising my children in? I was born here in 1970, and all the opportunity in the world began to unfold for me in this house. But now what's left is faded and tattered, and opportunity seems the last thing that might emanate from the walls of my old house. The dreams of my parents have melted into the nightmares of a city that can't solve its biggest problems, much less those of a single residence on the west side. Over the past 10 years, this part of the west side of Detroit has lost about 35% of its population. It's a post-white flight exodus that's carrying anyone who can afford it out of the neighborhood and likely out of the city. Some of the block looks like the house next door to my father's old house. It has likely lost its chance for rebirth. You could buy any house on this block for less than the price of a new Ford. But in a city that suffers such deep abandonment, this is hardly the worst area. It's part of the vast middle, neither solid nor completely written off. It could be years or a decade before city government decides what to do. Dave Bing ain't shit, says Les Thomas, sitting on the right. He's been on the 7100 block of Tuxedo most of his life and has seen the city deteriorate around it and throughout it. He says Detroit's mayor should go back to playing basketball. Nothing is better on Tuxedo. The only changes are for the worst. Marion Small has lived here since she was born just a year before I was. She remembers my father and wishes the city would tear down the worst houses on the block. She also hopes someone might save my old house. She asks whether that someone might be me. I tell her that like the city, I'm torn. The Parkers still own the house and their names are still on the deed, but it's their granddaughter who had been managing it as a rental before it went empty. Taxes are delinquent though and the city is about ready to foreclose. That could be my chance to intervene, but to what end? What's left to invest in? A nearby Livernois, once a thriving commercial corridor, some buildings have literally fallen into the street, leaving open facades that look like they've been shelled. The barbershop on the first floor was a hangout for my dad 30 years ago. Now, it's nothing. But there is also real life left in some corners of that neighborhood. St. Cecilia's Gym, where basketball greats like Magic Johnson and the Fab Five all came to play once upon a time, still stands as a beacon for young people in search of hope. So does St. Cecilia Church and the school and other institutions that just won't quit. And there's still life on Tuxedo. There's laughter and silliness, even in the shadow of rot and decay. An August Sunday brings remaining residents out to soak up the good weather and each other's hospitality. My father is gone, and his old house is now in shambles. But I can honor them both by refusing to turn my back. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to first ask you, if there are more homegrown journalists, more people of color in the newsroom, how might that reframe some of the conversations we're having on both the regional and the national front? 
and you can use the Detroit bankruptcy as, as a specific example. Well, I, again, I think the, the, the personal experience we all have growing up here comes to bear in news meetings, uh, story conferences, when you sit down to write your story, you're thinking about uh, not just what's happening now, but what's happened before and how it informs that. Uh, the role I play in our newsroom, I mean, my job is as editorial page editor, uh, but I also play a role as, as almost a consultant, uh, local consultant to, to, to reporters who come and ask questions about things, about history. Uh, there are lots of things that I can sort of volunteer in meetings that I know uh, uh, have happened before that, that help inform the stories. Uh, it, it just changes the entire environment uh, to have more people uh, who are of this place telling the story of this place. When I was in school a long time ago, um, but there were lots of opportunities. Not as long as I was. <laughs> Not as, there's not that much of a difference when I heard the year you was, I was like, oh, okay, Stephen. Um, but there were more opportunities, I think, for young people to explore journalism, to explore the arts. And now I'm finding more and more in talking to them, they, they have to really seek these opportunities out for themselves. And so their understanding of journalism is what they see on television, which is sometimes journalism, sometimes it's infotainment. How do you... How do you deepen their understanding of what this, what this career, what this profession is really about? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a great question. I, I, one of the things I think is, is crucially important with kids uh, is teaching them to tell stories uh, and to value the stories that they tell, particularly telling stories about themselves. That's really what, what uh, I think uh, connective journalism is about. It's about... Uh, uh, knowing the subject matter and feeling something about it and, and wanting to communicate that to an audience. I think uh, young, young kids almost instinctively want to do that, but they don't find opportunities for it. And schools, of course, don't necessarily uh, uh, draw it out of them. I think uh, one of the things we, we could do better in, in the newspaper business, I think, is, is connecting more with schools and getting them just to tell stories. It's not about the newspaper. Uh, because, of course, like I said, we're dinosaurs. We're going away. <laughs> um, uh, it, it is about stories. What's, what's going to remain, whatever form it is uh, in journalism, is stories and storytelling. Uh, and that, that personal storytelling is the storytelling that matters. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that Free Press has done is really uh, try to expand the way you connect with your audience using new technologies. Is that an opportunity to connect with, with younger people because they're usually way ahead on, uh, of, of that curve th than we are. Yeah, it's, a, it's an opportunity and also a disadvantage. Uh, it's an opportunity because as you point out, uh, you know, my kids know how to operate an iPad and an iPhone and all kinds of things that I would not have uh, understood at their age. And so they, they're in that world. They are, as we call them, digital natives. Uh, they're not adapting like I am. Uh, but it's also a disadvantage in cities like Detroit where you've got this profound gap uh, technology gap. There, there are lots of kids in the city who don't have a computer at home, who don't have an iPad uh, and an iPhone and all of these things. And so uh, addressing that gap is also one of the things you got to do. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Henderson.